Okay, so I'm talking today about drug-induced rashes, which is a topic that actually really could be very broad, but I'll try to focus on ones that are either common or important to recognize and possibly rare. So I have no conflicts of interest. Um, cutaneous drug reactions, most drug reactions, or not most, but many, 45%, manifest with some kind of skin reaction. So you probably see a lot of rashes when you're seeing an adverse drug event. Um, and in your hospitalized patients, it's about 2 or 3% who ultimately get a cutaneous drug reaction. Women are more prone to it. We're learning more and more about HLA types. There's a lot of HLA testing now to determine who's at risk. Um, people with concomitant viral infections are at risk, too. So you know when a patient has mono and you give them moxicillin, they get a rash. There are other examples of that as well. And then if they have a history of allergy to drugs, they're more likely to have more allergies show up to drugs, so they're more at risk. If they're exposed to the same drug or a lot of different drugs, that's a risk factor. And for certain medicines, if you start at a high dose, um, that'll give you a higher chance for an adverse cutaneous drug reaction. And that's particularly with lamotrigine and allopurinol. And then your atopic diathesis patients, patients who just have a tendency toward asthma, or, um, seasonal allergies, or eczema, they're going to be at higher risk for drug reactions too. So um, one of the problems with drug reactions is almost any skin disease can be induced by a drug. So it's a huge topic, um, and I'll go through just a few examples of that right now. So this is a patient, if you come to Grand Rounds tomorrow, you'll see some similar pictures to this, who has a photo distributed, so it's kind of the V of the neck, annular <coughs> scaly rash that's new. And so this is subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, SELE. But in her case, it's induced by terbinafine. That's the most commonly reported medicine to induce SCLE. Um, probably the most common actual medicine to induce that is HCTZ. This is a patient who started olanzapine and began to have just crops of these yellow-red papules. Some of them are coalescing into plaques. And this is eruptive xanthoma. So if you biopsy this, there's histiocytes, and they're just loaded with lipids. The patient probably has high triglycerides. So this is a drug reaction as well. Here's a gentleman who comes in basically with acne, but he's clearly not at the age where you expect acne, and he's on an epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. So this is the acneiform reaction to that. And this patient came in with literally dozens of these. We call these a crateriform nodule. That's the description we use. This is a keratoacanthoma. Keratoacanthomas are a well-differentiated um, version of squamous cell, but they don't usually appear in the dozens. And this is a patient who is on serafinib, so this is a neoplastic condition induced by a drug. And another neoplastic condition, this patient's an adolescent. She has inflammatory bowel disease, and she's on 6-MP. And just so happens she developed mononucleosis at the time she was on the medicine. And this is an EBV-driven actual cutaneous lymphoma um, because she just happened to be immunosuppressed at the time she got the EBV. And this person has a reaction that's a bliss reaction, and a dermatologist would look at this and say, okay, the, the blisters are kind of clustered. They're sort of trying to form a circle, like kind of a semicircle right now. This is typically something we'd recognize as linear IgA bliss dermatosis, and that's a naturally occurring autoimmune blistering disease, but it can be induced by vancomycin, which is the case in this patient. This is palmoplantar pustulosis, so little pustules occurring on the hands and feet. They heal with this, like, hyperpigmented macules, and this was induced by TNF-alpha inhibitor in a patient taking that for uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And lastly, um, just another example. This is a patient who's getting blisters on the hand. You can kind of see one sort of here, and they're healing with scars and little milial cysts. Um, she takes naproxen and goes to the tanning bed. This is pseudoporphyria. So it's kind of a combination of tanning plus naproxen. And then I threw this in here for you all, actually, because if you see a patient who's older and they've developed like an eczema that's chronic and it's really hard to treat, think about their medicines. So most commonly calcium channel blockers or hydrochlorothiazide, most commonly. So lots and lots of different t things could be actually drug reactions that aren't commonly thought of as drug reactions. Now, most drug reactions are type A. That means you know it's going to happen. It just depends on the patient and the dose. So like for us, isotretinoin, it's going to cause chapped lips. And if you give them a higher dose, they're going to get worse chapped lips. Um, but the ones we're really talking about now are type B. These are your idiosyncratic or unpredictable reactions. 
may be related to patient-specific factors that we don't always know about before we give them the medicine, and a lot of um, T-cell-mediated reactions, too. So I won't go through all these, but you learned these in medical school. Today we might touch on one type 1 reaction, so that's urticaria or angioedema, anaphylaxis. But the majority of what we'll talk about today are type 4 delayed type T-cell mediated reactions. Um, common patterns, your morbilliform eruptions, sometimes <coughs> you guys refer to this as maculopapular, some people will call it exanthematous. Um, that's a common one and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then a few others, fixed drug, urticarial, you can have vasculitis that's drug induced. A lot of blistering reactions, eczematous we touched on already, photosensitive and photoallergic, so that's like your patient on doxycycline could go outside and just get really red, that's a phototoxic reaction, or patients on thiazides can get a um, more of a photoallergic reaction. And then anything goes, we've already sh shown that a little bit. It's really hard to figure out which drug is the culprit, especially if a lot of hospitalized patients are on a lot of antibiotics, they're on a lot of medications. So pinning that down is never easy, but there are certain things you can look for. The pattern of the drug reaction might tell you oh, this is most likely induced by vancomycin, or that can help. Whether or not they've had the medicine before and tolerated it, what are their family members allergic to? That can help you. Um, and in general, recent administration, although some things are months or even years after they start the medicine, like lupus-like syndromes. So it's not always the newest medicine that you should suspect. You have your, um, your usual suspects, so antibiotics at the top of the list, anticonvulsants. You'll see as we go through the reactions that these are pretty much always on the list of things to look for. NSAIDs and allopurinol. But you know, if you have a patient who reads the package insert, they all say rash. You know, pretty much everything has that as a possible reaction. So you look at the rash, you try to decide what type of rash is it, give it a diagnosis, what else could cause it, look at the drug history, always search the literature because a lot of these reactions are actually in the post-marketing phase, they're identified then, so there can be new reactions that you didn't know about before. Um, there are a few confirmatory tests, but really not anything great, so you're not always going to be able to, get, you know, give it a slam dunk diagnosis, we know it's definitely this drug. Certainly tell the patient what you think it is, and then report it if you can. So this is a reaction that's um, not dangerous, but kind of fun to identify. It's called a fixed drug eruption. It's oval or round um, patches or plaques, uh, often erythematous, sometimes hyperpigmented or dusky looking. They can even have like a little blister in the center. And this is a fixed drug eruption. And this this eruption is interesting because it takes maybe a week or two to develop after the first uh, exposure to the medicine, but then if the patient takes the medicine again, literally within 24 hours, they have the same rash in the same spots. So they'll get the same area every time, plus maybe new ones. If they keep taking the medicine over and over, they can get more and more of them. It, it favors the face, kind of the lips and the genitalia, but also the hands and feet. And if they take the medicine too much and they aren't sort of adding it all up, they can get a generalized bullous fixed drug eruption, which is like an admission to the burn unit type thing. So it can get very serious, but typically it's just a few spots. Um, if you biopsy it, um, that's helpful. Although if you send it in as versus erythema multiforme, because you can't tell the difference, neither can the pathologist, because they look the same. And tetracycline, sulfonamides, and NSAIDs, barbiturates. But almost anything can, can cause it. And a lot of times with this, it's really hard to get the patient to sort of admit to over-the-counter use that correlates with the disease. You have to talk, talk them through that. Okay, we don't see as much of this drug-induced as you guys do because it's such an immediate reaction and so obvious, but urticaria, so these are edematous, erythematous plaques, often annular-looking, very itchy. Each plaque should only last 24 hours, so if you circle one of these and you come back the next day, that one should be gone, but others may be present, and that's, um, that helps you in your differential for, for urticaria. Um, so this happens pretty quickly. If it's drug-induced, it's really obvious because they have just taken the medicine and then they have the rash. They can also have angioedema, um, which is a, just edema of the deeper, deeper tissues, which can lead to airway obstruction or even anaphylaxis can occur. This is angioedema in the same patient whose uh, urticarial wheels I just showed you. So he has angioedema of the lip. Um, and uh, antihistamines are the treatment of choice. But... Drugs cause urticaria less than 10% of the time. So we usually don't end up in dermatology. We don't see this till it's chronic urticaria most commonly, which is over six weeks. And it's usually not drugs at that point. So we have more of a 
challenge in trying to figure out what it is. There is, um, there are other things to consider when you see a patient with urticaria. This is in children more commonly. I don't know if any of y'all are med peds. But if they come in with urticaria, but also fever, uh, joint pains, some other things going on, you have to think about other things in the differential. Because urticaria should just be plain, itchy skin, you know, with the wheels. They should go away within 24 hours. So this is a child who actually has serum sickness-like reaction, walk refusal, fever, urticaria. And that's often caused by cephalosporins. So if you have a hospitalized patient with urticaria, make sure that the wheels are typical. They're gone in 24 hours or moving around. They itch and not burn. And they don't resolve typically with any bruises. That's a sign possibly of like an urticarial vasculitis or other more serious conditions. And then make sure they don't have a lot of other symptoms going on. So this is a, a rash that's kind of newly described or, or going by a new name, I should say. We used to call this baboon syndrome. And now we like to call it strife. So strife is symmetric, drug-related, intertriginous, and flexural exanthem. And it can be, obviously, the buttocks, the most common area involved, but it could also be in the uh, axilla, um, between the knee, behind the knees and elbows. They're typically very healthy. They're doing fine. They're not feeling badly. Men have it more commonly, and it's mostly antibiotics, but anything goes. So that's a new one that, that you may see. Patients on chemotherapy can get a similar appearing eruption, and we typically refer to that as toxic erythema of chemo, the intertriginous pattern, but you could call it either way, also not real serious. This reaction, um, patients start to look really red and get tiny, tiny little pustules. They're all about the same size. They're not over a follicle, so dozens and dozens of pustules on a red base usually starts on the neck or in the Axilla is some sort of fold, but can progress from there. And this is AGEP, or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. Um, patients may have a fever in addition to the rash, um, but they shouldn't have mucosal disease um, or any other major things going on. There are three conditions we call scars, so severe cutaneous adverse reactions. And for some reason, this one got into the the category of scar, it's really not a very serious reaction. I mean, they, they do feel pretty badly at the time that they have it, but it doesn't have a lot of, you know, lingering side effects or internal, um, internal uh, diseases related. So antibiotics, antifungals. This is one where if you see it, it should be within 12 to 24 hours or so, uh, or 24 to 48 hours of the ingestion of the medicine. So it's pretty obvious link to the medication that causes it. One problem with it is um, if the patient has a history of psoriasis, there's a form of psoriasis that can look just like this, and that's called uh, generalized pustular psoriasis or von Zumbusch psoriasis. And in a patient with psoriasis, we try to never give them steroids other than topical steroids, because if they get an IM steroid or steroids by mouth, when the steroids are tapered or stopped, they're at risk for this like all over generalized pustular psoriasis, which is very uncomfortable and a little dangerous for them. So if a patient has a history of psoriasis and a new med, you're a little stuck. You can't really tell the difference between generalized pustular psoriasis and AGEP. Um, but AGEP will go away quickly. You only have to treat it with topical steroids. Um, and the other may take a little longer to go away. So history can help you there. They might have uh, neutrophilia. And, and otherwise, things with this are pretty pretty mild. You can just treat with topical steroids. It is kind of cute on this one. If you are curious as to which drug caused the reaction, you can do a patch test. We have two doctors in Louisville who are very skilled at patch testing. They can take a dilute form of the drug in petrolatum and put a patch on the skin, and it'll actually, 48 hours later, you take it off, and there's actually a red base with little pustules at the site. And so if you test all the medicines they were on, one should show the reaction. So you can confirm that reaction. Okay. Vasculitis can be drug-induced. Um, so typically, if it is, it's leukocytoclastic vasculitis or small vessel vasculitis. So it's going to present with palpable purpura. That's what we usually see with small vessel vasculitis. Um, it likes the dependent areas or areas under pressure, like this person's socks. Um, Typically, uh, antibiotics, thiazides, NSAIDs, the usual suspects again. It can be a longer onset, though. So you're waiting um, one to three weeks from the drug initiation before you start to see the palpable purpura and start to think about, okay, they've got vasculitis, what can be from? 
Um, so we see that they can have systemic findings, so um, joint pain, uh, GI symptoms, renal, CNS, pulmonary, they are at risk for death if some of these systems are involved. And I don't know if you've ever consulted dermatology for vasculitis, you know we, we kind of do a big workup on that because it's very hard to tell what causes vasculitis. I mean, drug-induced is one possibility, but th there are dozens of others. And there is a little, um, on this one in the biopsy, if you're lucky and you have a good dermatopathologist, if it shows eosinophils in the biopsy, then you're going to lean toward a drug-induced cause. So that's a little clue that will help you. But the workup's pretty extensive, so we'll write for lots of things, that, or you guys will to try to figure out what's going on with these patients. Uh, if it is drug-induced, it'll go away in two weeks, and you can treat with systemic steroids if you need to, if they have systemic symptoms. Okay, here's our really common drug rash, right? This is what we call morbilliform, which you may call ex exanthematous. Some people like to call it maculopapular. It's your typical drug rash. It itches. It's macules and papules coalescing into plaques. usually starts on the trunk and then spreads to the extremities. Patients are a little uncomfortable, but otherwise feeling fine. It's not a serious drug reaction, so you can actually treat through this. If you have a patient who's got this morbilliform drug, drug eruption and they need the antibiotic they're on, you can treat through it just treating them symptomatically. Um, and the, it can be a little violaceous in dependent areas, so that's not unexpected. One to two weeks after the medicine starts is what you're looking at there. Uh, if you stop the medicine, it should be gone in two weeks, and we just treat with topical steroids and antihistamines typically. Um, and it's hard to tell from a viral exanthem in kids. One caveat, though, with this one is it can look like a morbilliform drug rash, but you do really want to check the patient closely and make sure you're not missing something worse. So I'll go through an example of that. But in general, anytime you see a patient with a drug rash, you want to know if it's a severe one. Um, and the things that will clue you in is if they tell you their skin hurts instead of itches, that is not expected for your typical drug rash that's not worrisome. If they have facial edema, <coughs> fever, joint pain, sore throat, dysuria, enlarged lymph nodes, mucosal lesions, we'll get to that, um, and then abnormalities on labs, you start to think about, okay, I better make sure this isn't something much more serious than your maculopapular morbilliform drug eruption. So this is a pediatric case, but it can happen in adults. So this little boy, he started Lamotrigine for his oppositional defiant disorder. And he was on it for three weeks, doing fine. Then he's transferred to Coursera because he's got itching, he's not feeling great, he's got this diffuse rash. Mom says that his face looks swollen compared to normal, and he has fever. So we look at him, he's got diffuse erythema, a few pustules on his face, large lymph nodes, and he has eosinophilia and obviously elevated um, liver transaminases. So this is a condition that's called DRESS, or drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Um, this is our preferred term. It's not perfect because eosinophilia is a variable finding. So even though it's in the name, you don't have to have that. Or, you know, it's only in maybe 60, 70, depends on who you ask, percent of patients. It's thankfully rare, um, very common with the anticonvulsants, but other things are reported, which we'll come to. We used to say it had about a 10% mortality. I think that's much lower than we, than we thought initially. It's actually closer to 2%. And a tricky thing with DRESS is you can be on the medicine for two or even three months before you have any findings. So you really have to look back pretty far into their drug list um, to see what could have been causing it, if you see it. And then it doesn't always go away at the time we expect it to. It can become very chronic, and it's a little bit difficult. And one of the problems with this is just we don't talk the same language, so different people call it by different things. We like dress in dermatology. Um, the GI folks might call it drug-induced liver injury because liver is the most commonly affected organ. Um, drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome is commonly used, or they might just call it by, like, the name of the medicine, like, you know, dapsone-induced hypersensitivity reaction. And a dermatologist did once called it DIDMOS, which is drug-induced delayed multi-organ hypersensitivity syndrome. We like DRESS, so we'll call it DRESS, but um, hopefully we all know we're talking about the same thing even if we use different language. Um, so morbilliform eruption is the most common. It should involve more than 50% of the body surface area for you to start to think about this. But it can, they can progress to total erythroderma, a very uncomfortable condition of, you know, just full body redness. Um, they can have vesicles or blisters. 
They might report some mucous membrane involvement, but it's not going to look like, you know, your erosions of SJS and TEN that will come too soon. So facial edema is a clue. That's something you always want to ask about. You may not know the patient from before, so you might have to ask family members, so is this what their face usually looks like? Are they swollen? Look for lymph nodes. And then on their labs, they may have a high or low white blood cell count. Atypical lymphocytes, that's a little clue. Eosinophilia, yes or no, it could be there or not. And then thrombocytopenia. And the problem with dress is the internal organ involvement. So liver most commonly sometimes can pro progress so far that it needs liver transplantation. Kidney and pulmonary are next most common, but anything goes. They're the heart, GI, pancreatitis, it could be involved. Uh, many, many different organs can be involved. So the workup is pretty extensive because you want to find out exactly what, what you're dealing with here. So you have to do everything that's kind of on the left side of the screen. And then depending on the patient, you may consider some of these other things to test for, uh, to rule out other things or see what other organs are involved. If you take a biopsy of it, it may help you a little bit. Some people will take a biopsy and they say, oh, there aren't any EOs in the biopsy, so it's not DRESS. Well, that's not the case. So the biopsy can be very bland and you still have DRESS syndrome. And lamotrigine is by far the most common cause, but um, other anticonvulsants, allopurinol, um, and antibiotics also cause DRESS. And DRESS is one of these really interesting, to me, drug reactions where there's a virus involved, too. It's kind of like a combination of the drug and the virus that creates this, the syndrome. And one of the viruses we talk about is HHV6. That's the virus that causes uh, roseola and phantom that we have when you're little. Um, that sort of high fever followed by the little pink papule rash. Um, but in DRESS, it starts to reactivate. So if you started to check either IgG titers or PCR levels, DNA levels, it starts to go up with DRESS syndrome. Not in everybody, but in many patients. And then you can also have HHV7 or CMV reactivate too. And in the patients who have the reactivation, as you follow the levels of the um, HHV6 going up, they start to also have flaring of their fever and hepatitis. And they tend to have a more prolonged course, too. So we don't know what happens. Is the virus first and then the drug comes into the picture? Does the drug induce the reactivation of the virus? We don't know, but they're definitely related, and the people with viral reactivation do worse. There is various criteria to make the diagnosis, but a lot of them are made retroactively. So you have to kind of guess at it first, and then if you want to publish or put the patient in the registry, you can use these criteria. Uh, treatment for dress. So if you diagnose it, you got to figure out which medicine, take it away, obviously. Topical steroids. If they have pulmonary or kidney involvement, then you're going to start prednisone. It has to start at a pretty high dose and go for a long time. So you start high, and then you taper over about two months or up to three months, because if you take it off too fast, it all reactivates. You get the rash back, and the, you know, the internal involvement comes back, too. So it's a long, slow taper. Prednisone or systemic steroids have never been shown to help liver disease. So on those patients, you're doing supportive care and really monitoring. Um, and then some patients who we can't get off of steroids, we end up using cyclosporin or azathioprine, something to, to be a steroid-sparing medicine. And we don't treat with antivirals, even though there's a viral reactivation, unless there's some specific reason to, because it doesn't show any benefit. Another curious thing about dress is if the patients recover from their disease and you watch them over months to years, they have a very high risk for diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and thyroiditis. So you have to kind of follow them and check for those things. And then other autoimmune diseases start to develop as well. And they think that what happens is the Treg cells are doing really well during the, they, have, they call it DIHS here, but dress. The viruses are reactivating, but then after that, then the Treg cells start to lose their function, and you start to have autoimmune diseases erupt. So that's stress syndrome. One thing just to always have in the back of your mind when you see your morbilliform itchy uh, drug rash patient, make sure you're not missing dress. Okay. Now, moving on to a different one. This is a girl. She's 18 years old, a woman. She just had a baby, and she was diagnosed with bipolar features in a depressive state. And started on lamotrigine. I don't know why I picked two cases for lamotrigine, but three to four weeks after she'd been on it, she started to have some symptoms. So you see a little bit of crusting in her mouth. But a week before that, she said she had a sore throat. So she calls her doctor and had a sore throat. They thought she had an upper respiratory infection. They started on ceftonir. 
Then she calls a few days later and says, well, now I have a rash in addition to my sore throat. And you see on her chest this, these some dusky macules, basically, not much. So they tell her, okay, stop your seftonir. You're allergic to it. Well, by the time she comes into the hospital, she's still on seftin, I mean, still on, um, lamotrigine, but she stopped her seftonir. She's got skin pain. She's having trouble swallowing, blurry vision, crusting and discharge from her eyes. And you can look at her skin. She's got big flaccid bulla. Um, and you can tell that if you take, like, your hand and try to push laterally on her skin, it's going to just slough off. That's called a Nikolsky sign. So she's basically sloughing off her epidermis. So in this picture, you can see where part of it has already sloughed off. You've got the flaccid bulla. Um, and she had elevated LFT. So she has toxic epidermal necrolysis, or TEN. It used to be called Lyle syndrome after the person who named it. Um, he actually included a lot of staph scalded skin in his series, which he admitted later, but... This picture um, puts a spectrum up there that's really not a spectrum. So we used to consider erythema multiforme, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and TEN all a spectrum. Now we took EM completely out of that spectrum. EM is um, often not drug-induced, so we don't like to consider it in the same spectrum with Stevens-Johnson's and TEN. But you still have to be able to tell them apart, right? Because you've got targetoid lesions in both. You might have mucosal disease in both. Um, so let's talk about that a minute. So erythema multiforme is almost always from infection. HSV or mycoplasma pneumonia are the most common causes. And when you're seeing that, you should see classic targets, which I'll show you in a minute. But they should be on the extremities and the face. And they may or may not have mucosal lesions. Um, with Stevens-Johnson's, the, the targets are going to be more on the trunk, less so on the extremities. And they're a little atypical, and you might start to see blisters, or just like that patient showed you on the chest, just dusky macules. So here are typical targets. Typical targets should have three zones of color or more. So the center is this kind of dusky. It might even have a blister or an erosion. Then a ring of edema that's pale and a rim of erythema. And you should be able to feel these. Like they should be raised and typically on the hands or feet or, or arms or legs or face. Versus atypical targets, which have two zones, or they've got, you know, erosions in the center, and they're more on the trunk, then you're going to think more about Stevens-Johnson syndrome, less about erythema multiforme. So, and then SJS versus TEN is really just a matter of degree. TEN may start with just redness and, and blisters and Nikolsky sign and sloughing. Um, and then SJS can have sort of the targets, but they start to coalesce, and you have sloughing with that. And the main thing is SJS is less than 10% detachment of your skin versus TEN, which is greater than 30%, and then there's the overlap between the two. Um, the difference is significant because mortality is quite different. And so if you look here, at six weeks, for the whole thing combined, there's a 23% mortality. But if they have SJS, it's 12%, and if they have TEN, it's 46%. Um, and then if you start to look even out at a year, Patients who've had TEN actually have almost a 50% mortality rate going out that far. Um, so pretty serious. We try to estimate the body surface area, and you have to do that accurately using a system. Thankfully, it's very rare. Again, women are more commonly affected, affected people with HIV. Lupus can, can put you at risk for this. Malignancy, and then again, like allopurinol, lamotrigine, if you can do, introduce those medicines at a very high dose and not titrate it up, they're at more risk for these diseases. So there's our usual ones that cause it. And in children who have TEN and you absolutely cannot find a medication cause, the cause is usually mycoplasma and pneumonia. With TEN and SJS, the, the drug could be anywhere from a week ago to a month or more. So you do have to look back pretty far. And it's important to know that they have a prodrome. So they don't always start off with skin lesions, and, and that's the start of the condition. They often are feeling kind of bad and have fever and cough. So let's think about the girl that I presented, the 18-year-old. She was on Tylenol occasionally. She started her Lamotrigine three weeks prior to admission. And then she got a sore throat and fever but no rash and was given an antibiotic. So... Um, the antibiotic is thought of, and then she got a rash. So the antibiotic's kind of blamed, but you really have to do the timeline and look back a little further and realize that the medicine that she's still on is actually the causative medicine. So we have to look back. 
And everything that looks like TEN isn't, um, we've been fooled before, so we do biopsies and we do direct immunofluorescence to try to rule out some of these other causes of just, you know, sloughing skin. When you do a biopsy, which is what we'll typically do, um, you should see that the epidermis is just completely dead. And there's not a lot of inflammation to, to explain it. I mean, the, the cells have just, you know, apoptosed. They're dead. The whole epidermis is affected. There's a stratum corneum on top that's still basket weave, so you can tell it's a very acute process. So these are some patients who didn't have TEN, but sure looked like it. They had to be in the burn unit. This is vancomycin-induced linear IgA, more of a plaque form, not those little round ones we showed you before. And the biopsy tells us that it's not TEN because the epidermis is not necrosed. And DIF confirms the diagnosis. This patient we saw who had actually, this is a form of lupus. She stopped all of her medications for lupus and had this bullous eruption. Um, and again, you know, burn unit care because it's very severe. There is a prognostic tool for TEN, and if you take these factors and you add them up, it'll tell you what their mortality likelihood is, and that's um, useful. So depending on which of these factors they have, they can have up to a 90% mortality risk. So with SGS TEN, these are burn unit um, care, if, if at all possible. Um, lots of dressings. Burn unit does a really good job with them. Um, they need fluid replace, replacement. They can't control their own temperature, so a lot of um, care there. We don't start antibiotics on these patients unless there's a reason to, and we ask the um, burn unit doctors to please avoid debriding the patients because they don't do as well after debridement. Um, the dressings are the silicone-coated gauze that doesn't stick, so we put that on first, and then over that, the um, silver impregnated gauze. Um, and those are only, depending on which ones they use, only have to be changed every three or seven days, or some of them are even longer than that. And that's nice because you don't want a lot of sheer forces on the skin because you're taking off the top layer. So patients with TEN have very severe eye involvement. That's one of the most common in addition to the mouth. And if they survive the disease and go on with life, one of the most debilitating things is vision loss um, following the TEN. So... They used to just do, you know, come in and with a glass rod and kind of lice any adhesions and then put on topical antibiotics and steroids and stuff. But it wasn't doing too well in patients with really severe disease, so they do an amniotic membrane placement. They sew it over the bulbar and conjunctival, uh, I mean, and uh, the bulbar conjunctiva and corneal conjunctiva, and it protects the eyes during the acute phase. And that has shown some benefit in keeping patients from going on to complete vision loss. Um, Long-term uh, sequelae in women, you really have to watch for because they can have extensive um, issues with scarring and adenosis. <coughs> so we'll often try to get um, gynecology to come in and place a vaginal mold um, and hopefully prevent uh, some of the adhesions. Patients can go on to severe dental and oral complications like chronic dry mouth, some uh, synechia and gingival recession. We used to treat this with IVIG, and that was the standard because we thought it was fast, fast ligand that was causing apoptosis, and we thought there was a, sort of a natural anti-fast uh, ligand in the IVIG. Um, now it's controversial, so many people in the U.S. are still using IVIG. Nobody in Europe uses it now because we now think it's sort of uh, a different process that leads to TEN. We don't know for sure. Um, so there was one really big study that showed that actually patients with IVIG did worse than patients um, treated with just supportive care. So they suggested no IVIG, don't use that, try something else. Um, other groups just say, oh, they just didn't have the right dose. If you give them more, they'll do better. So this is an argument that goes on and on in dermatology. IVIG is not without its risks, so if you're giving someone that, first of all, it's extremely expensive, and then there are a lot of infusion reactions and other problems that you can create um, with the administration. So typically now we're using, uh, if the patient has um, good kidney function and they're young enough and healthy enough, we use cyclosporin because it seems to really um, block the, the effect of what's going on with the skin and help re-epithelialize a lot faster than they were doing in IVIG. So this is what we're typically doing now. Um, steroids in TEN we don't care for. Typically, you don't want to use those at all unless they have very little skin involvement, more like an SJS patient, and then you don't want to do it for more than 48 hours because the most common cause of death, death in these patients is sepsis. 
You just don't want to put them on steroids if you can help it. Um, the only randomized controlled trial was for thalidomide, and it was uh, had to be stopped early because it was so ineffective that the, the thalidomide group was doing much worse. So they had to stop that one. Um, so if you have a patient who reacts to phenytoin, you have to figure out what to, they can use next. And the question is, uh, which of the following would you use in a patient who has had a reaction to phenytoin, especially if it's a severe reaction? And the answer is the levetiracetam. We teach our residents that phenytoin, carbamazepine, and phenobarbital all cross-react. So if you have a reaction to one, you need to avoid all three of those. And then there's some evidence that lamotrigine also cross-reacts with those, so we take that one out as well, if, if possible. Um, so that just goes over it. And then if they have a sulfonamide reaction, that's a little trickier. We don't have any good data about whether you can use the arylamines versus the non-arylamines. Do they have to avoid all of them? If they had TEN, maybe yes. I mean, we, we don't really know. But certainly they have to avoid uh, sulfamethoxazole and sulfapyridine and actually sulfasalazine because when you take sulfasalazine in the gut, it releases um, salicylic acid and sulfapyridine. So those are three you definitely want them to avoid. And then many things go in to creating a drug reaction. Um, we, we've talked about many of these, like the dose, which drug, the, the current you know, area of research is pharmacogenetics. So more and more and more, there's tests you can do. Certain HLA types are going to react to certain medicines. If you test for it first, you can prevent the reaction. So th this is probably not even close to a complete list at this point for severe cutaneous adverse reactions. More and more, there's, there's tests out there. So some of these we shouldn't really see anymore. Back of your hypersensitivity in Caucasians, they're testing for that. We should not be seeing that as much as we did. Um, there are criteria for trying to prove a drug reaction. They're really more for research purposes. And we talked a little about this before, but for trying to like identify the culprit medicine, patch testing's okay. We talked about it for a minute with AGEP, but you wouldn't ever do it for a blistering reaction. Um, some intradermal testing's possible, but they have to find the right um, commercially available uh, preparation of the drug, which is not easy. Uh, lymphocyte transformation tests are still sort of research-based and not really um, available. And if you're really brave, you can re-challenge the patient. I mean, if all they had was a morbilliform rash or a fixed drug eruption, re-challenging is fine. You would not want to do that in a patient who had dress, Stevens-Johnson's, or TEN. So, so we've talked about that uh, many drugs cause cutaneous eruptions. Uh, it can look just like a normal skin disease, like subacute cutaneous lupus or some of the other ones we talked about. So you've got to always have drug in the back of your mind when you're seeing a patient with skin disease. Um, and uh, also watch for the severe cutaneous reactions and the signs of that so that you don't miss those.